Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things, they push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Um, who remembers that commercial that we just watched? Apple's Think Different campaign. It's the, it was their advertising campaign from 1997 to 2002, and it was launched six weeks after Steve Jobs returned to the company. Now, uh, for any millennials in the room, you may not know that Steve Jobs once founded Apple's was released by the Apple people, and then they begged him to come back in 1997, because between 85, when he departed, um, till 1997, when he returned, their financial fortune was in precipitous decline, and they were at the point of declaring bankruptcy when Steve Jobs returned to Apple in 1997, and the first thing he did was launch the Think Different campaign, because if he understood if Apple's fortunes were to change, they were gonna have to Think different. 20 years later, 21 years later, in 2018, in the summer of 2018, some of you may remember that Apple Computer became the first company that's value exceeded $1 trillion in human history. They went from famine to feast in two decades. And the turnaround was when they decided that they were gonna think different. And the truth of the matter is that for the turning point in our families is not when our kids start to act different, but when we as their parents start to think different, okay? For things to change, we've got to change. We have to think different about our kids. We have to think different about our behaviors, okay? Um, what we think about our kids becomes what we believe about our kids, and what we believe about our kids informs how we treat them. If we think they are difficult and controlling, how many of you, let's just all be vulnerable and transparent. I loved yesterday that the schoolers led you to such a beautiful place, but by the afternoon, you guys are up there and doing therapy with the microphone. Just, just being completely vulnerable about who you are and what's going on in your home. How many of you would describe your children as difficult? Come on, you amongst friends, look around you. How many of you would describe your children as controlling? Manipulative. Here's the thing, if you describe your children as difficult, controlling, or manipulative, you will soon believe that your children are difficult, controlling, and manipulative, and every single thing that they do, you will view as them trying to control you or manipulate you. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, David Schooler said, you can't live right if you believe wrong. And I was like, tell him, tell him. I was yelling from the back. What I should have said was, tell me, tell me. Uh, what do we do when babies cry, guys? We take care of it, yes? So a baby cries, we know that they have sounded their alarm and they only need four things. They need a clean diaper, for they have peed, them, peed in the pants or soiled themselves. Uh, they're hungry, they need to sleep, or they just need somebody to hold them. We meet the needs, but what we forget is when our kids start to move and they start to talk, we forget that they have needs. They're just mouthy little brats at that point. Somebody say amen if you ever call your child a mouthy little brat. <laughs> that is the most white people who have ever said amen in a church in the history of ever. <laughs> All right? We forget that our kids still need us when they start to talk and they start to move and they become little self-sufficient, right? That's why we ask our kids questions like, what do you need? Or how can I help you at our home? We abandoned what do you want a long, long time ago because it doesn't help. What do you need or how can I help you? Uh, it does two things. It lets our kids know that we're on our side, on their side, excuse me. How can I meet your needs? How can I help you? But it also reminds us in the moment what's actually going on. What's actually going on is those behaviors you're seeing is just an expression um, 
of a need. So um, thank you all for clapping along on I Saw the Light. Um, I'm gonna ask you to use your hands a little bit more now. How many of you would say, I have a kid who tries to control everything in my home? Why are some of you lying to me this morning? <laughs> okay, I have a kid who tries to control everything in my home. Um, when you ask them what do they want, the answer is they wanna control your home. But when you ask them, we ask what do they need, you might come to understand that they just need to feel safe. They just need to feel safe. Understanding that control is about feeling safe and not about your child, children manipulating or controlling you will cause you to think different about them and when you think different about them, you will treat them differently. Um, how many of you, again, more hands in the air, how many of you are afraid of flying or at least nervous? Don't like it, put your hand in the air. Okay, um, it is estimated that about one out of every four people in the United States is terrified of flying. Do you know how many people in the United States are terrified of driving? A lot less than that. You wanna know why? You know why, somebody tell me why. Because you're in control in the car. Even though statistically you're infinitely more safer in the air than you are between your house and the airport. But that doesn't matter to you because you're in control in the car. That's where, you, uh, that's where you feel safe. There's a man by the name of Clay Presley. Clay Presley is from North Carolina, and he was one of the passengers um, in the US Airways plane that Captain Sullenberger put down in the Hudson that afternoon all those years ago. You might imagine that it left Clay with an insane fear of flying. Do you know how Clay got over his fear of flying? He learned how to fly. He went and became a pilot because once he had control of the aircraft, he was no longer afraid of being inside the aircraft. Now, if that didn't convict you, if the unspoken words didn't convict you because once our children have control of our homes, they feel safe in our homes, we should weep and feel like we're not doing enough to make them feel safe. Uh, Kurt Thompson, who was with us last year, uh, he says that everybody comes into the world looking for someone who is looking for them. How many of you, um, how many of you like holding babies? Okay, I'm gonna put my hand down, I don't actually like holding babies. <laughs> well, they're fragile, I'm afraid I'm gonna break them. Um, but other than that, they're lovely. Um, so uh, when you're holding the baby, right, so, so you're holding the baby and then all of a sudden, the baby smiles at you and what do you do when the baby smiles at you? You smile back, you can't not smile at a smiling baby. Guess what the baby does when you smile? Same thing, right? So uh, in our brains, we have these, these mirror neurons and when the baby is two hours old, they can already notice that face that's right there by them and start impersonating him. You're connecting with that child, right? You're delighting in them and they're delighting back in you. But the problem is that the children in our homes were not raised in environments where anybody delighted in them. When nobody took care of them, when nobody met their emotional, physical needs and their need for touch. We were made for people to delight in us and for us to delight in them. So why is it so important that somebody delights in a child, right? It makes them feel safe and precious and uh, chemicals are released in your brain that are necessary for optimal brain development. So one of those chemicals is oxytocin. Uh, which isn't just a pleasure chemical, it's also a binding agent. So if that delight doesn't happen, happen and that oxytocin isn't released, all of the other good stuff doesn't fire and the kids' brains get miswired. Um, there are three times in your life when you will experience enormous amounts of oxytocin release. One is as a baby when somebody delights in you. Does anybody want to yell out what they think the other two are? I'll spot you opioid usage. That's why we have an opioid crisis, because it just feels that good. The other one is doing sex, right? Literally, the child is having that level of an emotional experience when you're delighting in them. But our kids never got that, right? When their brains get miswired, one of the things that doesn't cultivate in the brain of a miswired child is their ability to have empathy. You know what empathy is, right? Caring about other people not just yourself. So when your child is, um, is behaving, uh, is, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with dysregulated, but let's just call it behaving poorly at home. 
He doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about his siblings, you may say to your friends. And all of those things are true, and there's a reason for that, because they neurologically do not have the ability to care. Because of the miswiring of their brain, they cannot understand how their actions impact other people. So, um, how's the news so far? Pretty bad? But I want to leave you with this before we turn the corner and start heading somewhere good. No delight equals no empathy. If they did not have somebody who delighted in them, they literally are unable of even understanding how their actions impact other people. It would be like me asking you to put your telephone in airplane mode and then asking you to find me directions to a restaurant. And then when you told me that you couldn't, I'd start screaming at you. And then when you told me that you couldn't, I'd tell you that you always make excuses when you don't do the things I ask you to do. Now that seems stupid, right? Who thinks that would be really lousy of me? If I did that in here. What's your name, ma'am? Jennifer? If I yelled at Jennifer because she couldn't find me directions to a restaurant in her non-internet connected phone, how many of you would think I was a pretty lousy guy? And then why are we doing this to our children every day? Because that's what we're doing to these precious little babies. But here I've got great news. The brain can be rewired. That's not just a scientific discovery. We've discovered in the last 20 years in neuroscience that the brain is malleable, that we can change neurological pathways. 2,000 years ago, a guy named Paul said we could be renewed, our minds could be renewed, right? Our kids need loving, competent, available caregivers who will love them through hard times. It's interesting, the Bible says that it is God's kindness that will lead us to repentance. It's not his power, it's not the big scary stuff, it's not that he can send angels down, it's not that he can part the seas. The Bible says that it's none of that that leads us to repentance. The Bible says that it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. So perhaps if we wanna see our children's behaviors change, because that's what repentance is, a decision to change, perhaps it is our kindness that will lead them to repentance. Not our harsh words, not our punitive actions, not how you lose your Xbox, not, I'm convinced that the, the reason most of us allow teenagers to have cell phones is so that we can take cell phones away from them. <laughs> can I get an amen if that's you? Just be bold, claim it. If we want our kids' behaviors to change, we're gonna have to dial up the nurture. I'm not asking you to be permissive, I'm asking you to love them. Right, there's a difference between loving somebody well and just letting them do whatever they want to. I'm asking you to love the kids hard. I'm asking you to dial up the nurturing cares. I'm asking you to think different about your kids when you leave this place today. Here's something that I believe to be true. Being tough on a hard kid will make them harder. It will not make them any kinder. I'm gonna say that one more time. Being tough on a hard kid will make them harder. It will not make them any kinder. And I promise you, we have children in our home who yell and it drives us bonkers. And then I looked at my wife and I said, you know why she yells? Who wants to guess why she yells? Because mom and daddy yell. We have to be the change we want to see in our children. One of my favorite quotes by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. We need to be the light in some very dark places and we know together and we declare together that some of the very dark places are our homes. Because some days are hard. Some days your kids tell you that they hate you. Some days your kids pull, pulls knife in the kitchen. I mean, we got stuff, tough stuff going on and some of the darkest places we have to work in are our homes, so we have to be the light in our homes. So I'm gonna um, do something, the first time anybody on a stage of the microphone has ever done this. Can you please take out your cell phones? Oscar, would you please kill the lights? It's pretty dark in here, yeah? Everybody press their home button. So everybody press your home button. I cannot believe that half of you left your cell phones in the car. Do you see this little bit of light? Now let's play a different game. Everybody turn on their flashlights and shine it up. Look at that. 
We drove out the darkness with just a little bit of light. So go home. Think different about your kids. And be the light that drives out the darkness. Thank you.